Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Wednesday, February 9th, we're studying Luke chapter 8, verses 1 to 21. As Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom of God continues, he begins to speak in parables, starting with the parable of the sower. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us Pastor Tom Eckstein. Pastor Eckstein serves at Concordia Lutheran Church in Jamestown, North Dakota. Pastor Eckstein, welcome to Sharp Iron. Hey, great to be here. As we get started this morning, Pastor, let's talk a little bit of context. We've come through seven chapters of the Gospel according to St. Luke. What should we know, either broad context or immediate context, that helps us into Chapter 8 this morning? Well, very briefly, broad context. Uh, Luke is is uh, focused especially on the fact that that Jesus has come for for all. Uh, you know, we have his genealogy, of course, going all the way back to to Adam uh, in the beginning of the gospel, and uh, and th- there's a lot of focus on the fact that that uh, you know the 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 gospel is not merely uh, f- for the Jews. Uh, but 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 f- but but for everybody, and um, and there's a special focus in the gospel that that Jesus has come for the broken, and uh, so we're going to see that today, especially when we get in, into the parable uh, about the soils, that that um, not everybody, even though God wants to save everybody, uh, not everybody hears in faith because um, their hearts are hard. They, they, they resist the Holy Spirit. And we see saw that, you know, the immediate context uh, at the end of Luke chapter 7, uh, you know, the contrast between the Pharisee that had invited Jesus to his home and the sinful woman. You know, you, you have this broken sinful woman who receives Christ's forgiveness, but uh, a man who is self-righteous and hard-hearted, uh, who, who doesn't receive it. So, so even though God wants to save all people, that's very clear in Luke. Um, uh, only those who are broken, uh, beggars before God can receive that. I suppose this parable that we'll look at, not to say too much ahead of time, but this parable will help us to understand some of that dynamic we've seen already in the Gospel of Luke, that you do have these people who are coming to Jesus and believing him, they tend to be the the more unexpected one. You, know, you mentioned the the sinful woman at the very end of Luke 7, but you've got the the centurion earlier in Luke 7, you've got a, a oh, yes. leper, all these folks at Matthew, Levi, the you know, people that you wouldn't expect come to Jesus, they believe in him. And on the other hand, you've got these Pharisees who you would think the religious leaders should get Jesus, but they are already setting themselves against him. Seems like the parable that we'll read will have something to say as to why that's the case, or at least recognize that this is the case. It's not a surprise to Jesus that there are those who do believe and those who don't. Right, exactly. In fact, what we're going to find out is that um, to be religious or spiritual does not necessarily mean that that you have uh, the right understanding of God and salvation. You know, um, uh, a, a big problem, sadly, with the Pharisees is that even though they, they had a lot of talk about God and, and being faithful, uh, it, it was based on the idea of, of, of performance, you know, uh, be, because of who I am and what I've done. I have a good relationship with God. And so even though they thought they were tight with God, so to speak, uh, they they really had separated themselves from him because of their uh, refusal to see that they were sinners, beggars before God, who who needed uh, salvation uh, from Jesus, who, uh, especially in Luke's gospel, we see uh, has come to, to bring forgiveness of sins. And and so, you know, if, if you're a Pharisee who thinks that that you've performed well enough uh, to receive God's blessings, then you would expect the Messiah to come to you and pat you on the back and congratulate you. <laughs> but that's not what Jesus does. Yeah. He, he calls all to repentance. And uh, so sadly, you know, uh, even in our culture today, people who who have a lot of talk about being spiritual and religious, uh, if they view it from the point of view of performance, that, that God loves them because of who they are and what they've done, then with all their talk about God, that they're actually unbelievers, sadly. Mm, yeah, so we'll see that dynamic at play. 
faithful, unfaithful, both in the parable. Before we get to the the main parable in the text, there is a a little bit more information about some of the people who are listening to Jesus. So we we start here in Luke chapter 8. I'll read verses 1 to 3. Soon afterward, he, Jesus, went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others, who provided for them out of their means. So that's the first three verses of our text for today. Pastor Eckstein, just remind us, this proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God, that's a pretty significant phrase. What does that mean, that that's what Jesus was doing? Yes, and it's so important to understand the kingdom of God because that can be misunderstood. Uh, in fact, that there were people even in Jesus' day who, who heard the kingdom of God through their own filters. You know, they heard kingdom and thought, oh, Jesus is going to come and, and, you know, overthrow the Romans and, uh, and, and give uh, the, the Jewish people a, a nation of their own. But th- that was not God's kingdom. Uh, in a nutshell, when you look at the Gospels and even the Old Testament, uh, the kingdom of God is really about God coming into this rebellious world where people have turned from him and it's really a rescue mission um you know unlike this world where kings conquer their enemies uh the kingdom of god is about god coming to save his enemies and and to actually make them citizens of his kingdom uh uh by by dying and rising for them it's really quite amazing so the kingdom of god is really about uh, the person and work of Christ and his proclamation of repentance and forgiveness of sins. We see that at the end of Luke's gospel, after Jesus is risen, you know, um, what's the, the heart of his kingdom message? Proclaim repentance and forgiveness of sins in my name. And that's how God conquers in his enemies by capturing their hearts and through the atoning work of Christ, drawing them out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his light and love. So that's really how we need to understand the kingdom of God. It's a rescue mission. Mm, yeah, and, and we've seen Jesus do that. And I think just so far in Luke, it, the way that it's happened is both through the preaching of Jesus, you have his authoritative word, and then also the miracles of Jesus are a part of his bringing the kingdom of God, is his reign, His I like the way you put it, his rescue of this world, part of the rescue we sinners need is the healing of our our bodies, not just yes. now, but ultimately in the resurrection. It's it's quite something. So I think this you know proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God, we we want to make sure we understand that holistically as Luke has been presenting it to us, the both both body and soul aspects of that good news. Yes, and and where the forgiveness fits in is even though you're absolutely right that the kingdom of God includes renewing all creation itself, and and the mirror the miracles are are signs uh, that. God can indeed do that, but but you don't you don't get to that healing except through the forgiveness of sins. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, un, until you are reconciled to God uh, through faith in the atoning work of Christ, um, then then you know uh, until until you enter through that door, you don't have the hope of 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 the healing uh, that we see uh, in in all creation. You know, as I've mentioned to some of my members, you know, uh, we all get to live forever, but the question is where and with whom. You know, and 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 so uh, the the whole healing aspect of creation, Paul. You know, we we know that Luke influ- uh, Luke was very influenced by Paul. Uh, well, Paul in, in Romans eight talks about you know the redemption of our bodies, the redemption of all creation. But you don't get to that except through the cross, and and that's an important theme in Luke. Yeah, for sure. And as you said, going forward in toward the very end, what Jesus says after his resurrection about that proclamation of repentance and forgiveness in his name, that's the kingdom of God. That's how it comes to us today. I mean, even the the explanation that Luther gives in the small catechism to the, the petition, thy kingdom come, you know, when the Holy Spirit gives us faith, that's when the kingdom comes to us. We are made a part of that, that we have that forgiveness of sins. And then in that in that forgiveness, we know on the last day we will be raised from the dead. So yeah, per- well said, Pastor Eckstein. Look, looking forward then in the text, you've got the 12 there with them. We've heard about them back in chapter 6. But then we get some mention of, of some women, and I don't know that we've heard any of these women named specifically in the past. We've heard of crowds, we've heard of disciples, we've heard of apostles, but now we get women per- and some particular ones. Tell us a little bit about these women who are named here and just the role they play in Jesus' ministry. Well, you know, the, the first one he mentions is Mary Magdalene, uh, and it even mentions that uh, seven demons were cast out from her. And um, uh, she uh, 
is prominent in Jesus' ministry. And uh, people throughout church history have uh, sometimes equated her with the sinful woman. Uh, just in the previous chapter, uh, 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 when Jesus was visiting the Pharisee, the only thing is we don't have any rock solid uh, proof that that was the case. I mean, it may have been her, but but uh, we don't know. In any case, we, we see that this Mary Magdalene in in uh, uh, Luke chapter eight is one of several women that uh, are uh, very supportive of Jesus' ministry, and this is significant because uh, not only were women. Uh, considered as second-class citizens uh, back in Jesus' day, but especially these women, um, you know, they uh, Mary obviously, uh, having been possessed by demons, she would have been marginalized and considered an outcast. Um, we, we think of uh, uh, also, uh, you know, uh, Joanna, uh, the wife of Cusa, um, Herod's household manager. Um, you know. You know, when you think of all the horrible things that Herod did to have anybody associated with house, his household, it's like, oh, you have a stigma on you, too. So Jesus is, is here we have Luke going out of his way to mention these women who, uh, you know, uh, just being women uh, would, would mean, you know, uh, uh, in their society, that they weren't all that important, but they have baggage on top of it. And yet, Jesus redeems their lives. Um, and uh, not only are they forgiven and renewed in Christ, but here we see they, they, they become a significant uh, source of supporting his ministry. And, and uh, one little quick side comment here we see, you know, the, the balance we have to take in scripture. On the one hand, we see that Jesus is countercultural. He, he exalts the roles of women uh, beyond uh, the, the their 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 value in in that culture of their day he he exalts them and yet at the same time it's important to note that that even though Jesus utilizes these women for his his uh, uh, mission they're not called to be apostles or as we see in the rest of scripture they're not called to be pastors and and so the uh, women serve a very important role in the mission of the church but um, they, they're not called to serve in the pastoral office and, and represent and Christ there. And, and you know, uh, some would argue, you know, uh, those who argue in favor of, of women's ordination will sometimes make the point that, well, the reason Jesus didn't appoint these women as apostles is that that, that wouldn't have been accepted in that day. Well, the problem with that is Jesus was always challenging the culture. He was always, you know, uh, going up against the norms of his society. And so if Jesus indeed, want, indeed did want women to serve as apostles, I have no question that he would have appointed them as such. He was already using them in ways that were offending people. And, and so here we see the balance in Holy Scripture that, that uh, God has great use for the skills and abilities of women in his church. But uh, as we see in the rest of Scripture, they're, they're, they're not called to be apostles or pastors. And just a, a brief again on that that side note that it, it, I think this is a good a, a good place for us to be able to recognize where Scripture does present to us as you said Jesus challenging the cultural norms doing something that's very out of the ordinary making use of of these women in a surprising way we should recognize that but also not go beyond what Scripture actually says you know I mean don't take that and as a quote a principle and then run with it to do exactly. things beyond the text of Scripture. And I, th I think you've, you've given us a, a nice you know, format for, for taking a look at that. Recognize that it's there, but stick with the text, and don't use that to go beyond the text or behind the text to try to find something that the text doesn't actually say. So I, I appreciate that, that side journey there into the, the role of these women. And again, very important, emphasizing that theme once again, as you brought out at the beginning, that Jesus has come for all, and, and the broken in particular. Here are these women who have baggage on top of it. Jesus has redeemed them, and now they're supporting him in his ministry. From from there, Luke then takes us into, I think, a, a pretty well-known parable, what's called the parable of the sower often. And I want to, before we talk about what's actually there and read the text, I just want to talk a little bit about that title, Pastor Eckstein, because I, I, sometimes, you know, we know these parables by their titles, and that's not a bad thing. It's, it's good to have something that we can reference it quickly. We know what we're talking about. But sometimes the titles, I wonder if they give us the maybe the wrong impression or we forget other aspects of the, the parable. So parable of the sower, I think, is what it's usually called. If I'm not mistaken, I heard you call it the parable of the soils earlier. What If you had to title this parable, what would you call it? What do you think of that? 
Yeah, you know, it's, at least this title that we get in our Bibles, the parable of the sower, is a little better than some titles we get uh, of other parables. You know, I, I think, for example, um, uh, the, the parable of the lost sheep, you know, I, that, that should really be the, the seeking shepherd. You know, yeah. or or even the prodigal son. It re- really should be about the forgiving father. Uh, but 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 here, you know, uh, on the one hand, uh, sower works in the sense that God is the one who sows His word, brings His word into the world. He, he uses His church to do that, obviously. But it, He's the one who who sows the the word. But at the same time. Uh, it's important to understand what the soils represent. And and we'll get into that in a bit. You know, the, the soils represent, you know, various uh, spiritual states uh, that people are in. And, uh, and, and, you know, the, the mystery too, that, that even though God wants all to be saved, uh, his, his loving will for our lives can be resisted and rejected. And, and we'll, we'll talk in a bit about, you know, oh, what these good soils mean and, and what it means to be, good soil um but but the emphasis has to be finally uh, also on on the one who who plants the word because finally it, it's that word that brings forth life uh soil by itself is dead uh soil can't give life to itself it, it, it's the word finally that's planted in us that that results in a harvest mm. this is you know I, I mentioned in my introduction that jesus begins to speak in parables here and he starts with the parable of the sower I, looking through luke's gospel this seems to be the the longest parable and certainly the first one that gets a very specific explanation from Jesus but it's not the it's not the very first thing that you could classify as a parable I mean, for example Jesus told Simon the Pharisee a parable a very short one of sorts right. just at the very very beginning but this one the the parable of the sower the one that speaks of these four soils does seem to stand out within the parables as a almost an introduction is there something about this parable that I mean, there's a reason that it seems to to introduce this idea of Jesus teaching in parables. Yes, well, as we will see, um, uh, it, it it describes it basically answers the question. You know, uh, people are preaching uh, the good news of the kingdom. They're preaching repentance and forgiveness of sins. Some respond in repentance and faith. Others uh, believe for a time and then walk away. Others don't believe at all. And uh, this parable sort of answers that question. It's like, okay, yes, God wants all to be saved, but not all are going to respond. And and this parable sort of sets us up for uh, understanding that mystery. In fact, um, uh, at this point, it would be good to mention um, uh, the fact that uh, Jesus, uh, after telling the parable and before he explains it, he, he, he tells his disciples, hey, the reason I'm speaking in parables is uh, basically so that some, you know, uh, 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 you know, at the risk of being simplistic, he's basically saying so that uh, those who don't believe uh, will be distinguished between those who do believe. And then he, he quotes Isaiah chapter 6, uh, uh, so that those who are hearing, you know, may not hear, and, and so on and so forth. Now, it's important to understand what Jesus doesn't mean by that. Because if you look at the context of uh, Isaiah chapter 6, um, he, uh, uh, God in that section of Isaiah, it, at least initially, it appears as though he wants to harden people's hearts. He's saying, Isaiah, I want you to go and preach to these people and, and as a result, harden their hearts. But what we have to understand, uh, the big picture of Scripture is two things. Uh, God wants all to be saved. That's very clear. At the same time, God being omniscient, he also knows those who will harden their hearts and refuse to repent. And, and, and so even though it's God's goal to save all, he knows that some will, will reject and, and never believe. And so uh, in that sense, preaching to them solidifies them in their unbelief. A good example of that is, is Pharaoh. I'm, I'm preaching a sermon series to the book of Exodus right now. And, and, and we know from Scripture that God even wanted Pharaoh to be saved. Yet we also know that God knew in advance that in spite of everything he would say to Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh would harden his heart. And so God finally gives Pharaoh what he wants. And so the way uh, Jesus is using parables here at this point is after he tells the parable, we, we note that his disciples come to him and they don't quite get it. They're going, Jesus, um, could you please explain this to us? But here's the thing. They come to Jesus because they recognize he is their Lord. He is their Savior. And if they don't quite get it, they need to hear from him uh, to, to have further wisdom. 
In contrast, the unbelievers who hear the parable, not only do they scoff at the parable, but the last thing they do is humble themselves and come to Jesus and say, hey, give us more. Uh, help us understand. They don't do that. So uh, what, what Jesus is basically saying here is, uh, I'm telling these parables so that those who are believers will come to me for more, and those who think I'm a joke, well, uh, they will be distinguished as those who, who never want anything from me. Uh, and that seems to be the point that Jesus is making there. All right, well, let's go ahead and, and take a look at this parable. As you say, we get the parable, we get that interlude from Jesus as to why he speaks in parables, and then we get the explanation that Jesus gives. So we're picking up the text again in Luke 8, verse 4. And when a great crowd was gathering, and people from town after town came to him, he said in a parable, A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away, because it had no moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. As he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when his disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. But for others, they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now, the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. And the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But these have no root. They believe for a while, and in a time of testing fall away. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear. But as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. As for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart, and bear fruit with patience. No one, after lighting a lamp, covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a stand, so that those who enter may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light. Take care, then, how you hear. For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he thinks that he has will be taken away. That takes us through verse 18 of Luke chapter 8. We'll pause there with Jesus' words in for a moment. So, Pastor Eckstein, before we talk about the parable, and I think this relates probably to what you were talking about earlier with Jesus' quotation from Isaiah there in verse 10, tell us a little bit about this audience. In verse 4, it, this is more than the disciples, the apostles, these women. There's a great crowd. What's the significance of the audience to whom Jesus tells this parable? Well, what's important is, is that we realize we, we have this huge group of people, but sadly, they're all going to hear in different ways. Uh, some will hear in repentance and faith and, and desire more from Jesus. Others will hear in unbelief and walk away from him. In fact, we, we get a little uh, allusion to this at, 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 at the, in verse 18 when he says, take, I find it very interesting here that Jesus, after talking about a light, you know, the whole idea is that, you know, you don't want to hide the light of God's word. You want it to be, you want it to shine for all to hear. Um, but then he says, but take care how you hear. Okay, for the one who has, referring to those who are believers and, and trust you, Jesus, you're going to be given more as you come to Jesus and say, hey, clarify this, teach me, give me more, Jesus. But the one who hears uh, without faith, that's the one, uh, uh, it says, from the one who has not. He's referring to those who are unbelievers and are hardening their hearts. Well, then even what he thinks he has, you know, the false gods and treasures of this world. Um, he will even lose that. And, and so I think it's important that we, when we look at the crowds here, we're seeing that, that there are some, sadly, who will never believe and others who will believe for a time, but for various reasons, which we can talk about in a bit, they, they reject Jesus and then never come back. We got about two minutes here before the break, Pastor Eckstein. Just to, as a, you know, Jesus, he there's two parts to this. He tells the parable and then he tells what it means. Just help us to understand the picture that Jesus gives in this in this parable of the sower going out to sow. I know he's not talking about farming, but but what's the what's the picture that he's going to use that will and we'll talk about the meaning of it on the other side of the break. 
Well, basically, uh, again, uh, the, the sower finally is God, even though he uses his church, the Great Commission, to baptize, preach. Um, uh, uh, God is the one who, who, who is, is, is proclaiming his word. And, and that, that in this parable, that, that word is described uh, uh, as seed that, that results in, in life. But what we find out now is that that life can be uh, weakened and, 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 and snuffed out. And um, uh, what causes that, uh, obviously, is, is not a God's will, as though he, he wants some uh, to be lost, but rather it, it's the devil in our own sinful nature that finally re resists the life that God wants to give us and, and results in us being cut off from him. And so when we think of the parable of the soils, or, or, or in this case also the, the, the sower, we, we think of God uh, working through his church, through the preaching and teaching of his church. But, but, we, but as believers, we realize that, that not everybody's going to respond in the same way. Finally, salvation is up to God. So we will see that and more in the parable of the sower. We'll look at it more on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on KFUO. Talking Luke chapter 8 with Pastor Tom Eckstein. We will be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that Lutherans are helping new American immigrants get settled? How about struggling church workers in need of support and refreshment? And we assist at-risk children and provide disaster response to hurricane victims. Through LCMS recognized service organizations, we are doing all this and more. I'm Rahema Kavuga of Lutheran Church Extension Fund, and I don't want you to miss out on hearing what your brothers and sisters in Christ are up to. Visit interesttime.org to see how your support gives life to these works of mercy and love. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Wednesday, February 9th. We're studying Luke chapter 8, verses 1 to 21 with Pastor Tom Eckstein. He serves at Concordia Lutheran Church in Jamestown, North Dakota. Pastor Eckstein, prior to the break, we'd read the parable of the sower, the four soils, and Jesus' explanation. We'll look at it in a little more detail. Just give us some big picture thoughts from this, this parable. We've got the seed, that's the word of God, the sower, the Lord cast the seed. The church still does that today. And then four types of people. What are just some big picture theological ideas that we need to get from this parable? Well, for the big picture, before we look at each individual soil, the big picture we need to remember is that God is the author of salvation. He, he's the one who's on the rescue mission. And he really does want all people to be saved. And that's important to remember because as we go through each of the soils, we find out that not all people end up being in the kingdom. And it's important for us to understand that, that this has nothing to do with them not performing well enough or not being good for God. Um, God, God come, has come to save all sinners, and the scripture is clear that we're all by nature um, uh, spiritually dead. And so if there is life in us, it's because of God's uh, loving work in our lives uh, by the Holy Spirit through his word. And yet, that gift can be resisted. But the big picture really needs to be here is that God is the sower. He's coming into this world to save sinners. That That is his goal. He wants all to repent and come to the knowledge of the truth. So God didn't just come for, say, the elect. He came for everyone, and he does really want all people to hear this and believe it. That's one of the big points from this parable. Absolutely. Okay, what, what about, so that, and I think, I mean, I think you see that in the parable, just in the fact that the sower casts the seed everywhere I and mean, you know even even on the and it really stands out to me on the the path i i enjoy gardening and i i <laughs> never i never plant seeds say in a sidewalk or or in you know an asphalt where there's a crack in the asphalt oh i think i'm going to put a seed there i don't do that i i plant the seed where i know it's going to grow yet this sower is willing to cast it everywhere in yes. soils where he's probably pretty sure it's not going to grow, but but he wants salvation to happen there, so he still casts the seed. Absolutely, and and um, uh, so when we look at that hard soil, it's important for us to realize that that uh, and it's a mystery. We're never going to be able to wrap our heads around this. But even though God wants all to be saved, that is clear in Scripture. He also knows in advance that some are going to harden their hearts against Him, and yet He still reaches out to them with the gospel. Okay, um, I think part of the reason is like, okay, well, why would he do that? Even though 
he wants to save this person, yet he knows the person is going to reject it anyway. Why bother? I think part of the reason is to show uh, on the final day that that um, if people end up in hell, it has nothing to do with God wanting them there. <laughs> God did everything possible, even to the point of of bringing the gospel to those that he knew were going to reject it, to show that, that uh, God's goal was to save. And so if we end up outside the kingdom, it's not because God uh, uh, rejected us, it's because we have rejected him. And so one thing we learn in the hard path, you know, contra one false teaching that's out there among Christendom, the idea that uh, um, uh, 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 for example, according to Calvinism, God predestines some to salvation, he predestines some to damnation. And they would maybe argue that, well, the hard path are those that God never wanted to save. But then why would he even bother sowing the seed? In fact, uh, Luke and the rest of scripture is clear that God does want all to be saved, including those who harden their hearts uh, and never believe. And, and so uh, contrary to what Calvinism teaches, um, it is possible for people to resist the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, I, I think one good example of this is, uh, well, there's two obvious ones. One is when Jesus stands over Jerusalem and says, oh, how I long to gather you together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Or another example, Stephen's speech in, in Acts when he's being stoned. Um, you know, right before he's stoned, he ends his sermon, you know, you always resist the Holy Spirit. So, so here we see that, that the hard path is, is not hard because God has elected them to damnation. Uh, they're hard because of their own unbelief. And that's why I find it interesting in the parable when Jesus is explaining it. He doesn't say, well, the hard path are the people that I never wanted to save. No, he says the hard path uh, uh, represent people uh, uh, that the, the devil has taken away the word from their hearts. And, and, you know, Paul talks about that, too, in, in, in his letters that, that, you know, the devil blinds the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the, 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 the gospel of Christ. And so what we see in this parable is that, like you said, God almost foolishly is scattering the seed of his gospel everywhere, even on a path where there would be no life, to show that he is a gracious God and wants all to be saved. And so if some end, outside, some end up outside the kingdom, it's all on them. So take us that into the, there's two types of soil after that, that the word is planted and it starts to grow, but for different reasons, it doesn't bear fruit or doesn't bear much fruit. Tell us about, there's the rocky soil and then the thorny soil. What's going on with those two soils? Well, those are two good examples of how it, it is possible. And then uh, uh, this is another false teaching that this part of Scripture refutes. The idea of once saved, always saved. Uh, that once you're regenerated, you can never, ever, ever fall away. Um, uh, even if you, uh, you know, uh, 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 sin grievously. Uh, that's not the truth in Scripture. Uh, it is possible for those who believe to walk away and never return. Now, God doesn't want us to do that. He, he, he wants us to come back to him daily in repentance and faith. But Jesus is simply showing here that sadly, there are some who are going to follow me for a time. But then for various reasons, uh, whether it's the, the, the allure of the riches of the world or the persecution that comes from following Jesus, uh, there will come a point where some people will say, hey, I didn't sign up for this. You know, I thought following Jesus meant that I was going to have my best life now. You know, if if following Jesus means I have to grieve over my sin or if following Jesus means that, you know, uh, I have to be persecuted. Well, then forget this. Uh, I'm going to find something else that's more appealing. Uh, now, having said that, I, I want to make it very clear that the rocky soil, the weedy soil is not talking about the failings of repentant Christians are sins in moments of, of, of weakness. You know, we think of the Apostle Peter. Uh, even he denied Jesus three times. But how did he respond? Uh, he didn't say, whew, well, uh, I'm glad I, 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 I was able to get away from that scary opportunity where people thought I was a follower of Jesus. I, I, I'm going to run away and never return. I'm glad I got away with that. Uh, no, he, he wept, weeps bitterly. Uh, as soon as he sins, he's convicted by the Holy Spirit, and we know that he's restored in Christ. So the, the soils are not of the, of the uh, weeds and the rocks. They're not talking about believers who struggle with sin and have failings. It's talking about those who believe for a time and then say, wait a minute. Uh, if being a Christian means doing this, then I'm done. 
I'm through, I'm out of here, and I'm never going to return. And sadly, we have seen that happen in some people's lives. They follow Christ for a time, and then they turn away and never return. And nothing breaks God's heart more than that. I I understand what you're saying, Pastor Exxon. I think, and I think within the Gospel of Luke already, Judas is a good example of. Although we haven't heard the whole story of Judas yet, in the listing of the twelve, Judas was there, and Judas Iscariot. I should clarify so that we don't give Judas the son of James a bad rap. Judas Iscariot, he's listed among the twelve. He really is one of the apostles. He does believe, and yet. Luke's already told us he's going to become a traitor. So yeah, Judas, I think, is a good example of of what happens to these two soils. At the, at the same time, I, I want to talk a little bit about this because I, I get what you're saying, that this isn't just a, a Christian having a, you know, I mean, we, we fall into sin in a moment of weakness or something like that. At the same time, is there is there a bit of a warning here for us Christians so that we would watch out for times of testing or the riches and pleasures of this life so that we would take care during those times when those things are present, tempting us to ignore the word of Christ that has been planted. Lest, I mean, you see what I'm saying? Like, it seems there's, there's a, an oh, element yeah. of self-examination here, even if it's not precisely talking about that. As a Christian, I want to look at those two types of soil and reflect on my own lives, examine myself, lest those things would cause me to ignore the word that's been planted. Exactly. And, and uh, I think the way that Jesus wants us to respond as believers when we hear about the rocky soil and, and the weedy soil is that, you know, we're all as sinners, we're all capable of, of you know, of, of falling and, and, and betraying God and, and being tempted to turn away altogether. And, and then Jesus is basically showing us uh, that doesn't end well. So if, if you're being tempted to say, well, I think it would be better for me to just to, to, to turn away from this whole Christianity thing. That would be the most foolish choice you could ever make. And so by looking at these soils of the reeds and the rocks, you know, when, when I find myself being allured by the world or, or being tempted to, to turn away from Christ because of persecution, then, then my response needs to be to fall on my knees and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. You know, keep me faithful. Or, or like Peter, you know, uh, 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 you know, grieving uh, uh, over our sin and then running back to Jesus, uh, 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 never forgetting that that He alone is our life, and that, that that to to lose Him means losing everything. So I agree with you. You know, obviously, on in one sense, Jesus is is giving a theological explanation here that some are going to believe and then turn away and never return, but at the same time, He's saying to us believers, but it doesn't have to turn that out that way for you. You know, remember that I'm your life, and that uh, without me, there's nothing. In terms of another application for believers for the church, and this was coming to my mind, particularly as you were talking about the seed that lands on the path, the the hard soil. One of the things I recall from Luke chapter 5, when Jesus called Peter, they had that miraculous catch of fish, that you know, Peter and, and James and John, who were with them, got to, got to see that when the word of the Lord is spoken, it, and I'm going to put in air quotes, it, it works. The word does yes. something. And I, I think maybe this is a, I don't know if reality check is quite the right the right way of, of thinking about it, but there are going to be times where those fishers of men go out and they're going to cast the nets or in, they stick with the parable here. He, they, they're going to throw the seed and it's going to be met with unbelief. It, it seems, at least when I'm trying to put these two things together in this way, that Jesus here would give his disciples then, and his church still today, confidence that even yes. though the word will be rejected, keep keep putting it out there. Keep sowing the seed, even it's when, when it's rejected, because it's not a problem with the word. There's there's something in our sinful hearts that's rejecting it. So keep at it, is, I think would be Absolutely. one of the, the encouragements. Absolutely. In fact, uh, I, I think of Isaiah chapter 55, where, where God says, you know, the word that I send forth will accomplish its purpose. Now, that doesn't mean that every time God's word is preached, everybody's going to come to faith, because um, we know that they don't. But what God is saying is, it is going to accomplish its purpose, meaning... I do want to save people, and that's exactly what's going to happen. Some are going to be saved. Uh, will some never believe? Yeah. Will some believe for a time and then fall away? Yeah. But will some be converted unto eternal life? Absolutely. And I think that's what, you know, the, the, the story about the, the miraculous catch of fish. It's like, uh, it, I think he's, he's saying, you know, uh, have the big picture. You know, e even though you might experience a lot of rejection, when you're witnessing. Remember that God is going to use your witness to save some. And on the final day, 
we will see that great catch of fish. Mm-hmm. On the final day, we will see that God's word did indeed, um, you know, uh, 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 accomplish its purpose uh, with the result that many dead and sin were, were redeemed and, and become part of God's kingdom. And that's encouraging because sometimes it can be discouraging to be a Christian or a pastor because uh, especially in our culture today, we find that the Christian message is, is mocked or, or people just, you know, aren't interested. And, and we have to forget, uh, we, we have, I mean, we have to never forget that, that God's word is, is going to be effective. Uh, we, we, we don't know how that seed is, is, is going to um, bear fruit in some people's lives. And we have the promise that it will indeed do that. And so, you know, when we're, when we're facing opposition from the world, we have to remember, hey, God just calls us to scatter the seed and we'll leave it up to him uh, to do the work of salvation. And we can take great joy in knowing that some indeed are going to be saved unto eternal life. That's right. The seed will land on good soil. That's And that's verse 15, the last type of soil Jesus talks about. Tell us a little bit about this good soil. What What is it that makes good soil? Yeah. And that's, that's important to understand. Uh, by good soil, it doesn't mean that that I'm somehow more uh, receptive to God than other people. And this is where we, we get into the mystery of salvation. Uh, we're all spiritually dead. We're all incapable of loving God and trusting in him. So if we do have repentance and faith in Jesus, it's entirely the work of God in our lives. So that leads to the mystery, you know, um, oh, why is God able to get through to some and not others? And the Bible doesn't answer that question in a way that makes sense to our reason. Uh, the, the, the Bible's answer is simply this. Some reject it and uh, never believe. Some believe for a time and then reject it and never return. But others are brought to faith and are kept in the faith unto eternal life. And uh, the mystery there is that even though God wants all to be saved, uh, some reject it. But those who are saved, are saved totally by the grace of God and his work alone. So to be good soil does not mean, well, I was just a little more decisive in following Jesus than the other guy. You know, I I had a little more of a willing heart. No, no. If I have any repentance, any faith at all, it's the result of God's word in my life producing that fruit. And so if I am a believer that's following Jesus, I give God all all the glory for it. And, and, I, and uh, that's why, too, it, it, it helps us to have a, a proper attitude those, to those who are unbelievers, you know, rather than saying, well, if they were just a little more like me, you know, they, they would believe. No, uh, except by the grace of God, there I would be, too. And so we continue to witness to people because I've pointed this out to my members, even though God knows who the people are that will harden their hearts and never believe. Uh, he hasn't revealed that to us. So we shouldn't give up on somebody. We, we shouldn't say, well, I witnessed to that person once and they never believed. So, you know, uh, the, uh, I guess God doesn't want them. Well, we don't know that, you know. So so we continue to witness and we, we let God do the work. But again, to be good soil means to be receptive. And and and, and the only reason we're receptive is that God has, God himself has tilled us up with his word and opened our hearts to receive that life. And so we give him all the glory. That's right. I mean, and that's where I think the, uh, what Luke has given us of Jesus so far really prepares us to understand that good soil correctly, as, as you're pointing out in that way where it, it's made good by the word that's been proclaimed. You know, I mean, over and over again, in Luke's gospel, the word of Jesus has had authority. And so that, that same word that's, that's being proclaimed, that's being sowed, that's what's transforming it into the good soil that makes the heart receptive to, to believe it. It, it all is, is to, it's all God's doing. And, and I think we've, we've seen that throughout Luke, and we shouldn't lose sight of that when we come to this good soil. It's not a matter of pride, but a matter of thanksgiving. Thanks be to God that he has planted that seed in me, that he has caused it to bear fruit, that I do trust in Christ, that, that bearing fruit with with patience, the repentance. I think what, what you said about Peter earlier is a great example of, you know, that that repentance that that keep, God keeps doing that in us. You know, it's not oh, just yeah. a, a one and done thing. Yeah, in, in fact, it's like Luther's, you know, not all of Luther's 95 theses were all that great. He, he still had some growing <laughs> to do at that time in his life. But his first one was really good. You know, the Christian life is a life of daily repentance and faith. Um, you know, uh, 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 we have to avoid the idea that, well, I get into the kingdom by grace, but then I stay in it by being perfectly obedient. Well, that's not scriptural. Now, granted, we should strive to be perfectly obedient. I, I think of Luther's morning prayer, 
you know, help me to live without sin today. But then I, 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 we have to remember Luther's evening prayer. Forgive me for the sins I've done today. <laughs> and so every day is a day of I want to live for the Lord, but I'm a beggar and I live totally by grace and, and his forgiveness. And so uh, it, it, it's a life of daily repentance and faith. God working in you through baptism, through his word, through the supper. Hmm. Now, Pastor Eckstein, that's in verse 15, that's where the parable of the sower or the four soils, quote, ends. But Jesus just keeps right on talking, and he starts talking about a lamp that's lit, and you don't cover it up. It, it, maybe it's related to the parable of the sower. How, what's the move that Jesus makes? What's the new image? How does it relate to what we've been talking about in the parable of the sower? Yeah, I think it's directly related. I I, I think here he, he changes the metaphor. Instead of the word being seed, it's, it's the light a light shining in the darkness, and he makes the obvious point. You know, when you light a lamp, you don't, you know, put it in, uh, hide it. You, the whole purpose of a lamp is to give light to everything. And, and so he's reminding the church, I've given you the good news of the kingdom. I, I, I want you to shine it forth uh, in the world. Uh, but then uh, just a reminder, and I think, again, I mentioned this earlier, verse 18 is alluding back uh, to the, the parable, take care how you hear. Okay, because uh, obviously, if we hear God's word with doubt and skepticism, we can't benefit from it. So, so God is calling us to, to humble ourselves and to hear in faith, to hear in repentance. And then the good news is that if we hear in repentance and faith, we will always be given more. Uh, God wants to give to us. Um, but sadly, uh, those who harden their hearts and, and hear in unbelief, you know, even what they have will be taken away from them. Uh, that's God's point. So, you know, as the church, we, we, we shine the word of God uh, for all the world to see. But then Jesus reminds us, be careful how you hear, you know, hear in humble repentance and faith. Now, our text for today does include a few more verses. Jesus finishes these parables, and then his mother and his brothers show up on the scene. So we're picking up the rest of the text now. This is Luke 8, beginning at verse 19. Then his mother and his brothers came to him, but they could not reach him because of the crowd. And he was told, Your mother and your brothers are standing outside, desiring to see you. But he answered them, My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. That's the rest of our text for today. That takes us all the way through Luke 8, 21. So, Pastor Eckstein, this is a pretty short scene to the point, and yet there's some pretty important theological points that we can draw from, from here. What's going on? Why does, well, I mean, his mother and his brothers, of course he should want to see them. What's what's going on here? Well, I think, you know, th this ties, um, uh, it's re it actually relates to, to the uh, previous two parables in the sense that, that, that the Word of God, uh, when, when it uh, rescues people from their unbelief, it creates a, a, a new people, a new family. And I think what Jesus is getting at here is all, all the earthly associations that we think mean so much uh, uh, mean nothing to God. You know, we, we think of the Jews who thought, well, we're God's darling. He doesn't really care about the Gentiles. And God has to remind them, no, you're not saved by race. You're saved by grace. Or uh, in, in the case of, of family, you know, we, we tend to think, well, you know, nothing's closer than, than blood. You know, uh, being part of a family is what's important. And then Jesus reminds them, uh, no, it's not the, 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 the blood that goes through your veins, your genetic relationship to your uh, various people. It, it's my blood. It's my blood shed for you that makes you part of the only family that matters, the family of God. And, you know, here we have Jesus' mother and, and brothers. Now, we know Mary was a believer. Um, but but his brothers, we know that that for uh, Jesus' ministry, uh, th they were not believers. Now, uh, uh, later after Jesus' resurrection, we know uh, uh, Jesus' half-brothers, James and Jude, become believers. But but at this time, even though they're related to Jesus, um, uh, you know, uh, in the sense that they're half-brothers, uh, if you believe that Mary and Joseph had children after uh, uh, Jesus was born, which I believe they did. So they're related to Jesus in, in that sense, uh, physically. But Jesus is pointing out here is, no, that's not the family that matters. What matters is is being brought into the family of God through faith in the blood of Jesus. You know, uh, in other words, my mother and brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Uh, those who, who believe the word of God and, and, and continue to live in, in that daily repentance and faith. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as believers in Jesus, we become part of the family that really matters. And one brief story that, that I thought of when I'm reading this is when I was a pastor in the St. Louis area years ago, 
I had the privilege of 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 mentoring a uh, um, a young man who had converted from Islam to Christianity, mm. and he had pointed out to me that he can could never go back home because he he was dead to his family, and they wanted nothing to do with him, and they would even put a death sentence on his head for wow. converting to Jesus, and then he teared up and he said, "But I'm so glad glad that God has given me a new family here, the family of of." fellow Christians, the family of believers, they're my brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers now. And I thought, wow, that's exactly what Jesus is talking about here. That's a fantastic account. I mean, yeah, because I, I, I think when I read this, I always tend to think of, okay, I need to be careful so that I don't place certain earthly relationships above where they should be. But man, what a, what a positive example of, of what Jesus is talking about, that that in the church, we have this, this family that that lasts forever. I mean, you know, and it's a different family than, than our earthly family, but it, it, wow, what a wonderful gift. Now, and thanks be to God that there are plenty of faithful families, speaking in that earthly sense, that also belong to the family of God together. I mean, I think of, of our, our own congregation here at Grace, and, and maybe this is true in, in North Dakota as well. You know, you, certain families have have a pew in in your in your sanctuary. Yes. You know, that's that's where yeah. that family sits. I mean, and what a what a wonderful witness when the the generations do and pass on the faith in that way. Thanks be to God. But in cases where where that hasn't happened, thanks be to God that He does give us this eternal family as well. Yes, and so the, the, there's a real balance here. On the one hand, we we have uh, you know love your mother and father, honor them. Um, and and that's true even if they're unbelievers. But at the same time, there's a reminder that that even though we are to show love for our earthly family, uh, the 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 family of the kingdom comes first. And you know that that's sort of Jesus' point when elsewhere he says, uh, "Don't love your father and mother more than me." You know, uh, it's one thing to love another human being properly; it's another thing to make them into an idol. You know that we 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 worship in place of Jesus. And so I think of that young man uh, who became Christian, even though he had formerly been Muslim. You know, he 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 left behind everything to to embrace the family of Jesus. Uh, it, he realized that that the the real family that mattered was the family that is bonded together by the blood of Jesus shed for us. And um and 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 we 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 should have that love in the church. Uh, I I think you will agree that sometimes. Uh, our church families can be a bit dysfunctional, <laughs> and that's that's why we need to remember that God uh, has has uh, b- bound us together as brothers and sisters by His blood. And so, when we do find that we're not loving each other as we ought, we repent. We ask God to forgive us, and then we ask Him help us to love one another, even though we're not related physically. Uh, in this world, uh, we are related by your blood. We're 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 part of a a, a truer family that will last for all eternity, mm-hmm. and we have to remember that. I think that will affect the way we treat one another uh, in our congregations. Most certainly, I mean, a fantastic application of of this last part of the text about Jesus, who his family is, and what a joy it is for us to be a part of that. Pastor Eckstein, with just about a minute and a half left, left, help us to to summarize this text, wrap it up for us, point us to the good news that is ours from Luke chapter eight. The, the ultimate good news, even though you know Jesus uh, gives this negative that some are going to never believe, others will believe for a time and, and then fall away, uh, the, uh, the big picture really is good news. We, we have God coming into the world on a rescue mission. He's, he's planting his word in dead soil in order to bring forth life and salvation. And so we, we have a God who longs for us to be uh, a part of his kingdom. And, and so uh, that's why Jesus says, be very careful how you hear. Uh, when you hear my word, uh, know that I love you, that I forgive you, and that your greatest uh, blessing is to be part of my family for all eternity. And so as believers, we, we can look at this parable and go, wow, um, God has planted his word in my heart. The reason I have repentance and faith is that God has come to me and he wants me for all eternity. And 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 that good news gives us the strength and the desire to live in daily repentance and faith unto eternal life. Pastor Tom Eckstein is pastor at Concordia Lutheran Church in Jamestown, North Dakota, helping us today with Luke chapter 8, verses 1 to 21. Pastor Eckstein, thanks for being our guest today. In my privilege. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. If you have any questions about Luke chapter 8 or any of the gospel according to St. Luke, please send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org or use the open mic feature on the app to send a message to us. We always love to hear from you. 
Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.